Hello and welcome back to Contemporary Art for week three. This is your probably second lecture you should be listening to and it's on some developments in art in the late 1950s and early 1960s in Europe. In particular two movements, one associated mostly with France called Nouveau Realism or New Realism, one in Italy called Arte Povera or Poor Art. What's happening in this period of time is the Lyrical abstractionists or takis or uh, so-called stainists in Europe have been established for about 10 years. The abstract expressionist painters and color field painters in, in New York have been established for about 10 years. And there's a younger generation of artists coming up who are going to be kind of going in a different direction than that, that group that came right before them. Uh, one of the things that really happens in this period is a questioning of not just things that the abstract expressionists had questioned like you know should we do figural representation or what's the function of painting is painting to represent an object uh, or an experience outside of itself or is it meant to be an object and an experience in its own right those are fairly radical questions for what they are but this group that is coming up in the early 1960s and we've seen a little hint of this with the Gutaj group uh, a little bit earlier in Japan. But in America and Europe in this late 50s, early 60s period, there's a kind of retrenching that goes on where artists are going to extend themselves beyond just questions of uh, what form should my art take, uh, which is what we see with the sort of traditional media of painting and sculpture in the immediate post-war period. And now artists are going to say, well, what's the, even the point of making a painting? You know, why even do something that goes into a gallery? Why make a separation between art and life itself? So they're going to go in a slightly different direction than their immediate predecessors in this period. And so today we're going to look at a couple of artists and a couple of groups in, the, in Europe which are taking on these new ideas. And they're not even that new. I mean, all of this stuff is really a retread of stuff that Marcel Duchamp and the Dadaists had said in the teens and 20s, but they're taking it into new directions and starting to lay the groundwork for what we'll see later on with pop art and then especially with performance art in the later 60s. So we're going to start by looking at Nouveau Realism or New Realism in France, and then we'll look at Arte Povera in Italy today. So this, uh, so okay, so let's get going. The first artist we're going to look at is this guy, Eve Klein, who is an interesting character. This is a picture of a gallery installation from a show he did in 1958. And the long title is there, The Specialization of Sensibility in the Raw Material State into Stabilized Pictorial Sensibility, which is kind of a long title and doesn't necessarily tell you much. The short title is The Void. A void, of course, is an empty space. So you walk into this gallery and there's this box in the gallery. The entire gallery is painted white and there's just this box in the gallery filled with nothing. And actually what Klein said about this show is, you know, he said, oh, I've been painting, I've been working with color, I've been working with monochrome, I've been doing all of this, and I've been finding that it's not, I, I don't want to battle with paint anymore. So I've decided that my new paintings, as he says, are now invisible, and I would like to show them in a clear and positive manner in my next Parisian exhibition at Iris Clare's, and that's the gallery that you're looking at here. So Iris Clare, who is an important figure in this avant-garde of the late 50s and early 60s because she's very supportive of all this kind of, you know, conceptual, philosophical stuff, uh, mounts an exhibition for Eve Klein in which this is basically what you get an empty box inside the gallery, the void. And it seems in some ways probably on the surface a little bit ridiculous, but you have to understand what's going on here is more than just the object you see in the gallery. It's a whole sort of philosophical position that Klein is taking about the importance of painting or its lack of importance, about what it is that you do when you go to a gallery to see a show, you know, what the whole purpose of art making is or art consumption is. And that becomes a really important theme for this group of artists in the 50s and 60s. And it's, again, not something entirely new. I mean, we'd seen Marcel Duchamp questioning the gallery system and the art museum system and the way that we fetishize art so that if something is signed by Leonardo da Vinci, it's worth millions of dollars, and if something is not signed by a known artist, it's worth 
you know, a quarter of that, right? Even if it's the same painting. So um, that's a little bit of what's going on here. Klein had, this is a teeny gallery, by the way. Uh, he sent out 3,500 invitations in Paris to this show, and about 3,000 people showed up. It's interesting because among the people at the gallery for this opening were um, Albert Camus, who was an existentialist novelist, friends of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, running in that same crowd. He wrote a novel called The Stranger that you may have had to read in high school at some point, which is really a, a story about the meaninglessness of life and the, the necessity of making choices in the face of that meaninglessness, very much part of the existential philosophical group. So my point here is that I've raised this issue before of the existentialist movement and this philosophy kind of permeating European culture in the post-war period, and that will continue to be true, and it's not only happening in the level of books that are published or works that are shown, but also quite literally the people who are doing this stuff are intermingling with one another. Klein was a bit of a showman, you know, so for this exhibition he had a special cocktail made. As we'll see, he became associated with the color blue on purpose. Blue became his kind of signature trademark color, um, and he had a cocktail made for this that it combined like gin and Cointreau, which is a, a blue liqueur, and something else, I forget what, and then a blue food coloring. And so that was the only cocktail you could get, was this blue cocktail at this show. And um, happily for Eve Klein, it turned out that the food coloring that was in this cocktail made everybody's urine turn blue the next day. So he felt like he had really extended his creation and his performance into the bodies of the people who had come to the show. And this was all very central in Klein's workings. He's very interested in um, the barrier between the artist and the creation. The, the whole idea of the artist and the way that we, you know, um, revere art with a capital A and the whole idea of how we revere stuff that's signed by an artist and whatnot and the performative or, or creation um, of art and, and what role that takes. So this is all kind of an introduction to some of Klein's ideas. Oh, by the way, and this is also, I mean, taking a page from the Marcel Duchamp playbook, Iris Clare had cans of sardines that had the information about the opening of the, the Void exhibition. She had those made up and sent out to people. So a little bit of Dada, um, you know, randomness there. And of course, a can full of sardines that's packed tightly together is the complete opposite of that empty box that you see in the gallery. So there's a little bit of play going on here. A couple of years later, I mean, Klein is friends with all these other artists who are working in Paris at the time, and in his apartment in October of 1960, they got together and they wrote this little manifesto, this little statement about who they were as a group and uh, what they believed in. Okay, The new realists, it says, have become conscious of their unique, uh, or their collective singularity, their collective uniqueness. New realism is new approaches, new perceptual approaches to the real or to reality. Uh, okay, so it's a little bit of a murky statement, but what he's really trying to say or what it seems that he's really trying to say in this group in their art is that they're not trying to make symbolic representations of experience like the lyrical abstractionists. They're not trying to embody experience like the abstract expressionists like Jackson Pollock. They're trying to come to a new understanding of reality itself, whether that's using art or the lack of art, you know, just depends on the individual artist. Uh, so the one of the major signers of this is Eve Klein. It's done in his apartment. Another artist we'll look at today is Swiss by birth. Uh, Jean Tangley also signs this manifesto. Tangley will actually move to the States in 1960, and so he brings some of these ideas and some of these working methods with him when he comes. Here's another very famous early or piece by uh, Eve Klein where he's working with the whole idea of performance and time and space. And this is actually, it's before Photoshop, but it's a doctored photo. It looks like it's 
Steve Klein jumping off the roof of a building, getting ready to get squashed flat as a pancake on the ground. He didn't actually do this performance, but it is a photograph that he had made and then replicated as part of a fake newspaper that he published that was all about, it was sort of a, a, a whole manifesto on new realism and um, flinging yourself into the void. He said the piece of art in this ostensible performance here was that space and that time between when he leapt off the building and splattered onto the ground. That that space was the, meant to be the space of the, uh, or the, the, the central chunk of the performance. And in explaining this photograph, Klein once said, the reason for this action was, in order, and I'm quoting him here, in order to paint space, I owe it to myself to go there, to that very space. And it's that weightless moment between the um, roof and the ground that he was interested in. He later, by the way, also <laughs> captured this idea of the void and space and all of that by selling um, square inches of air within his studio to in to people who wanted to buy them um, you didn't actually get anything you just got a except a certificate that said you owe these coordinates within the studio of Eve Klein and they came with a contract that said that um, if you wanted to sell the the void if you wanted to sell this piece of air that you owned to anybody else you had to charge at least double what you had paid for it uh, Klein then also, I mean, and he had copies of this that would be sort of certificates of authenticity, and then he went and destroyed all of them so that people could not verify that the certificates that they had matched up anything in Klein's records. So, again, really, <clears throat> the documents themselves are not what's important to Klein in this. It's really the concept of what are you buying when you buy a work of art? Are you buying a piece of the artist? Are you buying a piece of his creativity? Um, can you really own stuff like that uh, or not? So it's really the concept and the ideas that are important to him in this new realist movement. Klein also became known for his monochrome paintings. This was another avenue that he explored, um, <clears throat> and again, touching on ideas like artistic creativity and identity. He did a whole series of these single color paintings with this very bright cobalt blue color that he actually had worked with a, a um, <clears throat> chemist to develop this pigment, and that became his signature pigment. In fact, in later years, he was known as, or actually this is his later years, he died in 1963, quite young, of a heart attack. Um, <clears throat> he called himself Yves Le Monochrome, uh, Yves the One Color, and um, this painting, IKB 191, is one of his monochrome paintings. IKB stands for International Klein Blue, and in fact he had a patent on International Klein Blue, so that using this pat <clears throat> patented color was akin to a signature in itself. And by the way, he has become one of the top five sellers in um, contemporary art. By 2006, one of his monochromatic sponge paintings sold for um, almost $5 million. So he's become really quite substantial in the aftermarket in, the, in recent years. And in his lifetime, these shows that he did really created quite a stir and were very influential on other artists for introducing or really reintroducing a lot of these ideas and these questions about art and creativity into the uh, world of art. Here's another one of his monochrome paintings. In this case it's actually been uh, covered with soaked uh, sponges. He believed that by freeing yourself from having to do paint mixing and just getting into one color you had an open window into freedom, he said. Um, and he liked that blue, too, because it is a very kind of, you know, intense and um, deep color. If you stand in front of one of these paintings and stare into it for a while, it has this weird optical illusion of it, it becomes hard to see where the surface of the painting is, you know, so it has this kind of expansive quality if you're looking at it. Um, and so he liked that idea, you know. 
another way in which Klein started to question the notion of painting and the notion of the artist as creator and the whole kind of, you know, artistic genius thing was he started doing a series of paintings in which he did not actually do the painting. He would hire models, he would hire women to get themselves covered in paint and then either lay down on a canvas and leave an impression of their body behind or sometimes press themselves up against a wall on which a piece of paper or canvas was hung. And so he had essentially living paintbrushes that he would direct and ask to um, ask to pose or ask to stand in certain ways on <clears throat> or, or against a canvas. So, and there's actually a there's actually a video of one of these performances where he had also composed the monotone symphony, a symphony played on one note only for about 10 minutes to accompany this painting. Uh, so the monotone and the monochrome, these things kind of go together, right? So you can watch the original, unfortunately it has no sound, you can watch the original footage of one of these performances on Blackboard, and you can also hear a recreation that was done at a gallery in Germany a couple of years ago of the Monotone Symphony with the performance going on in the background, or with the painting going on in the background. So if you want to see how this all came together. Of course, you know, feminist critics of this have, have been a little bit skeptical about what really Klein is doing because, you know, cynically speaking, you have these young, fit, beautiful models covering themselves in paint and rolling around on canvases. You got to wonder what are they, you know, what's he really getting out of this, right? Uh, but either way, what he said was, you know, the point of the artist is not to get your hands dirty. I am all about the concept and directing this, you know, I am the one who puts this stuff together and that's where the art resides, he said. This is one of his anthropometries. This is the only one I know of that he actually participated in. You can just see the butterfly shapes on either end are actually male figures. Those are actually Klein himself laying down on the canvas. Uh, the other, the two, um, one in from the left and one in from the right are, are females, and then um, the other three are Yves Klein himself. So he did do this once, but then he decided it was better to have the models doing this and having them do it in, um, in performances, in public performances. Oh, and here's a good quote from Klein. <clears throat> in this way, I stayed clean. I no longer dirtied myself with color, not even the tips of my fingers. The work finished itself there in front of me under my direction in absolute collaboration with the model, and I could salute its birth into the tangible world in a dignified manner dressed in a tuxedo. By this demonstration, or rather technique, I especially wanted to tear down the temple veil of the studio. I wanted to keep nothing of my process, uh, nothing of my process hidden. So he's saying that what he's doing in using these live models and directing them and then sort of staying out of the nitty-gritty himself is <clears throat> and doing this in a public place is completely stripping away the mystery of creation that is so much a part of the um, kind of cult of the art world. And this painting I'm showing you here is one of the last paintings he did. As you can see it is done in international Klein blue and um, this actually is now the Walker Arts Institute in Minneapolis. So if you're ever up that way, you can see the, the original in the flesh, along with the tray of paint that was used uh, that the models laid down in before they pressed themselves on this uh, painting. This was part of an experimental documentary that included other footage, um, weird, randomly unrelated footage of, for in one case, um, geese being force-fed to create foie gras, which is this very kind of tender liver pate that's made from overfed geese who get fed really fatty foods and aren't allowed to move around. Um, the decapitation of a bull, um, chicks being dyed different colors to be stuffed into Easter eggs, um, all kinds of unpleasant things, and then Eve Klein. And this uh, show, or this film was actually shown, uh, it's called Mondo Kane. And uh, Mondo Kane was shown at the Cannes Film Festival, 
and it got Klein a lot of notoriety among the public. Not good publicity, bad publicity. And unfortunately for Klein, this was also right at the time when he um, suffered a severe health crisis and ended up dying. I believe he died of a heart attack. Uh, and quite young. He was only 34. There on the left is the, um, the, the little tray of International Klein Blue for the models who did the Mondo Kane Shroud performance. And then there's just some um, um, blotter paper basically on the wall behind, behind that. Klein also did things along the lines of Marcel Duchamp. Like here you have a plaster bust or a plaster model of this very famous Hellenistic Greek sculpture in the Louvre. It's at the top of one of the main staircases at the Louvre, this Hellenistic sculpture, the Victory of Samothrace. Uh, he bought, you know, in the gift shop one of these tchotchkes and then covered it in international Klein blue to make it his own, right? So here are shades of LHOQ and uh, Marcel Duchamp, for example. And he also designed furniture. Here's a piece of furniture he designed, a coffee table that is a clear lucite box that is completely filled with that international Klein blue pigment. So branching out into different media and really kind of playing with notions of creativity and performance and the idea of, well, who is the artist and, you know, who's, who's the creator and uh, what part of the process or production is the actual work of art. Another nouveau realiste who actually had signed that piece in um, 1960 was also heavily active in New York in this period. This is a guy who's Swiss by birth, but mostly working in France and then America, Jean Tangley. Tangley was an interesting uh, kind of a sculptor, but here again, like his fellow nouveau realiste, he's kind of moving away from what you would traditionally consider the sculptural media and moving into um, different realms. He collaborated with a friend of his who was an engineer to create pieces like this. This is a, a piece of machinery. He was commissioned by the um, Museum of Modern Art to create a, a kinetic sculpture for the sculpture garden at the, at the MoMA. And he collaborated with a couple of people uh, some local artists, including Robert Rauschenberg, who we'll talk about next time, and um, some engineers to create a mechanism that would destroy itself over the course of its of its um, operation. And that's what you're seeing here in performance or in process is this sculpture, this kind of Rube Goldberg sculpture called Homage to New York from 1960. And this was a really historic moment. It was a really kind of galvanizing moment for people in the art world and a really kind of interesting publicity moment for the Museum of Modern Art. He set up this sculpture which involved all sorts of picking trash out of trash cans around New York um, and getting you know just any kind of effluvia and detritus that he could including sewing machine motors to help run it lawn mower uh, motors and weather balloons and bicycle wheels and gears out of various machines that it was set up so that um, it would trigger this whole process where it would set itself on fire and hammer itself to death basically it is a new kind of sculpture not something we have seen before we've seen Earlier in the 20th century, some artists had experimented with, you know, mechanical motion and light and sound as part of um, a sculpture. So rather than being just a piece of stone or just a piece of wood, that a sculpture would become a kind of organism or uh, a mechanical organism. Here you've got one that is deliberately meant to be time limited, uh, one time only thing that will exhaust and destroy itself. So really kind of turning the whole idea of the art object as a um, precious object. And it also has to do with emerging concerns about technology, you know? And I mean, this makes sense right after World War II. I mean, 1960s, not long after World War II, people are still thinking about, and certainly with the rise of nuclear weapons, people are really thinking about the destructive aspects of machinery and the dangers of technology. Um, one of the things that Billy Coover, who was the engineer who worked on this, said is 
The self-destruction or self-elimination of the machine is the ideal of good machine behavior. Okay? You don't want machines to take things over. You don't want them to get too smart. You don't want them to um, you know, get ahead of themselves or get too big for their britches. And this is a kind of fear that you see in other works that are produced in the later 20th century. Um, for example, Blade Runner, um, Space Od or 2001 A Space Odyssey. If you're into science fiction at all, this is a major theme in science fiction is at one point does artificial intelligence get too smart, you know? So this is kind of an early manifestation of that. Tangley had also exhibited at Iris Clara's gallery, by the way. There is one of the fragments, by the way, that's left of the homage to New York. It's in MoMA's permanent collection. Uh, it was not meant to survive. And in fact, uh, it was kind of a, you know, kind of a um, weird experience, I guess, for the people who were there to see it happening. Here I've got another example or another photograph of the object in the process of its own self-destruction. It was made of this combination of found objects and time-limited, moving, kinetic sculpture meant to destroy itself, raising these questions of technology, as I said. Here's a quote from, there's a short Time Magazine article that I'm asking you to read this week, but this will give you a sense of how people receive this in the general public. A machine that destroys itself was the billing, and it proved irresistible to Manhattan's earnest pursuers of the avant-garde. Last week, some 250 of them braved cold and slush to watch Switzerland's, as Switzerland's John Tangley fiddled and fussed with his 27-foot-high tangle of white-painted iron in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art. An hour and a half later, the suicide-fated machine started flaming and sawing at its mixed-up insides, turned bulky despite several judiciously aimed kicks from its creator, got doused betimes by an anxious fireman, and had to be finished off with an axe. So, in other words, I mean, you know, it didn't quite destroy itself. It had to be helped along by the New York uh, City Fire Department. But here, the kind of radical nature of this piece is something that Time Magazine is kind of poking fun at a little bit. Tangley also said, you know, this is really... Was this was really meant as a um, you know philosophical statement about technology, the city, things like that. And there's the wreckage. That's the piece that's still in the permanent collection of MoMA. Uh, what's left of the charred remains of homage in 1960. Subsequently, this developed into a whole sort of subgenre of sculpture that's still going on. There's a, a group uh, based on the West Coast now called Survival Research Laboratories that makes these giant kind of spectacular machines. Sometimes they destroy themselves. Sometimes they just create these incredible displays. Jean, um, Jean Tangley continued to make these kind of mechanical sculptures until his death. Uh, but this became a whole subgenre. In fact, his friend Eve Klein, although Klein died about a month before his son was born, Eve Klein Jr. is also a kinetic sculpture maker, although he tries to make biomechanical sculptures so uh, that incorporate elements of um, living organisms or replicate living organisms. So this has continued to be a kind of whole other genre of sculpture that emerged with the Nouveau Realists in the 60s. Shifting gears a little bit, I'm just going to talk about one of the artists from this movement called Arte Povera in the late 50s, early 60s in Italy. Now here again, it's post-war and this new generation of younger artists coming up, not only are they questioning all these kind of established rules about the art world, especially in the wake of the destruction of World War II, but they also are often quite literally people who don't have huge amounts of money and resources at their disposal so they're going to start using everyday objects and materials and putting them together in ways that generate all sorts of philosophical questions so here's an example and again there are other arte povera artists but we're only going to look at this one piero manzoni unfortunately just like eve klein piero manzoni died really quite young from a heart problem, undiagnosed heart problem. He was about 29 when he died in um, 
It was like 63 or 64. Anyway, before that point, he he's really the exemplar of this arte povera, poor art movement, where the materials are mundane, easily accessible, and then really what's going on is all sorts of um, philosophical questions. In Artist's Breath, this is a 1960 work, where he has blown up a balloon with his own breath and then nailed it onto a plaque, and the plaque's got his name on it and the date and sort of certifying that, yes, this is a very important um, uh, work by the artist. He sold these, priced them based upon how much volume of artist's breath was in each balloon because what you're buying is that intangible thing created by the artist, right? It's the same way that we value Picasso paintings more than those by other artists because they're signed with the name Picasso, right? So here, Piero Manzoni, here, artist's breath, you know, the very stuff of life itself, the, this kind of intangible creative genius of the artist is encapsulated in this balloon and you can buy it. Well, of course, He's also poking fun at that whole idea, right? Because it's just a balloon filled with air. So uh, anyway, but he did sell these based upon how big the balloon was and therefore how much volume of artist's breath was available in the balloon. Uh, another kind of ironic thing about this is, of course, these don't last. This is its current the current state of one of these artist's breath. I was showing you an earlier sculpture or an earlier photo of the sculpture. Here it is as it is in the Tate collection in London right now. So as you can see over time, you know, the balloon collapses, it disintegrates, the air of the artist's breath is gone. All you have is this trace that's left behind. Um, so is it worth anything? Uh, it's, you know, I mean, this is again where he's kind of raised this question that is questioning the whole purpose of the signing of works of art and what it is in an artwork that is valuable. He also did other kinds of conceptual pieces. Here are two examples of his line series that he did between 1959 and 1961. Each of these lines was just basically a long line of ink on paper and that was then curled up and put into a tube and as you can see each tube is labeled with the artist's name, the date, and how long each line was. So you have um, 11 meter lines, 4.9 meter lines. The idea of this was you were never supposed to open this up, that you were purchasing the idea of the line that had been created by the artist. Each was priced according to how long the line was. Um, he did break some of these out so that you could see them just to give people an idea of what they were, but they, for demonstration purposes, as he said. Um, he's selling the idea of line, he said. Um, the idea that you can buy this closed in a container the way that you could buy a painting, right? So art, and then also, you know, how do you price it? Well, in this case, he sold it by the meter. Um, and again, this is all meant to be kind of a play on the values of the art world and the art market. And I mean, of course, what's ironic is then these things do get bought, they do get put into museums, their price does go up over time. Here's another example of Piero Manzoni's using everyday objects and then generating all sorts of questions with them. This is a gallery exhibition called The Consumption of Art by the Art Devouring Public from July of 1960. He took hard-boiled eggs, and he dipped his thumb in ink and he put a thumbprint on every single egg and then you could buy an egg for a uh, price okay and then eat the hard-boiled egg there at the gallery so you're literally completing the work of art because it is a show or a, a, a performance called the consumption of art by the art devouring public so there has to be an art devouring public to make this thing work uh, he's also making fun of the whole idea of what goes on in the gallery, eating eggs, you know, consuming stuff. Like, this is why you why you go to a gallery, why you buy art. It's not a spiritual experience. It's something that you're doing to shop, right? It is <clears throat> also emphasizing that important role of the art consumer and, you know, of course, turning the egg into a work of art simply by putting his thumbprint on it. Probably the most um, 
controversial or still somewhat, you know, people still react with some revulsion to this uh, example of Piero Manzoni's use of everyday materials and this kind of idea of um, of artistic creativity and the, the, you know, the artist's name making something valuable. In 1961, this is only a little bit before a little bit before his death, um, Manzoni issued an edition of cans that were basically um, cans of his own feces, okay, that he called Merda d'Artista, which literally means artist shit in English, and there you can see it's labeled in a couple of different languages. Um, preserved, produced, tinned, dated, stamped, authenticated, signed by the artist himself. And this plays into the idea, I mean, this goes back to Duchamp and his idea that it's, it's, if you have a problem with this, then it's, you know, because you're seeing this in a certain context. Also the idea that it's the, um, it's the artist's idea that matters. It's not the actual object itself. Uh, he produced a limited edition of this. It also pokes fun at the idea that people will buy anything by a certain artist if it has that artist's name on it. He priced the cans based upon their weight, charging, when he was selling them originally, the equivalent for the same weight of gold. So it was priced by the ounce, uh, and the, the price was based on the price of an ounce of gold. All right? So it is, you know, an artist's creation. It is a... Um, object that's signed and authenticated. It's a genuine product. It is something that is, um, you know, this, this intangible value of the artistic creation. Or is it? I mean, he's partly really just making fun of that whole idea. Now, I tell you even more ironically about this, um, about this series, the Artist Shit series from 1961, is in recent years, these things have been selling for fifty, sixty thousand dollars. I mean, even more than they were priced at in their original incarnation. Some of the cans have corroded and leaked over the years. Some of them have exploded. Um, so you can imagine that this is kind of an um, a, a curatorial challenge, and that's something we'll continue to see. I mean, people continue to use all sorts of really, um, all sorts of really earthy materials to make their art, and that always continues to pose a preservation challenge. So uh, we'll continue to see this as a theme. But anyway, that's uh, probably Manzoni's most famous thing from 1961, this, this the, the limited edition of artist shit. Another thing he did, and again, here, this is playing into the idea of creation and um, uh, artistic genius, and also into the idea of authenticity and... Um, um, the materials that are at hand. He did a series of what he called living sculptures in 1960 and 1961 where he would sign people and he had a series of different ways of signing on people. He used live nude models, okay. He had actually gone to see um, a, Klein, a Klein exhibition in 1958 and was incredibly influenced by Eve Klein's ideas as I think you can see in some of the stuff that I've shown you. So here in 1960, he does this series of living sculptures in which he also, after he signed them, he would issue a declaration of authenticity, so like a certificate. And if the certificate had a red stamp, that meant that the, the signed person was a subject, was a whole work of art for the rest of their lives. A yellow stamp limited the artistic status to a particular body part, okay? A green stamp on the Declaration of Authenticity meant the individual was only a work of art under certain circumstances, like when they were asleep or when they were running or things like that. Uh, a purple stamp meant that the, uh, the, the object had been paid for. Okay? Um, so here you've got all sorts of interesting questions about, well, where does, you know, where does creativity lie? What about the use of materials? Is it just the artist's idea? Is it just the artist saying something is a work of art that makes it a work of art? 
Again, all very Duchampian ideas and things that are really coming to the forefront in the later part of the 50s and the 60s. This is certainly true in Europe, and as we'll see, it also is true in the United States, where in the late 50s, early 60s, a couple of artists who are a bit younger than the abstract expressionists come on board, and these are some guys who actually get called by the critics neo-dadaists. So that is what we will be looking at next time, is the neo-dada movement in the States. Well, I think you could say Arte Povera and New Realism are both kind of retreadings or reworkings of Dada ideas as well, but they aren't officially called Neo-Dada. Uh, anyway, that's what we'll be talking about when I see you next time.